Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is the last webinar in our three-part series on how to start, grow, and ultimately maintain a dominating law firm website. And today we're going to talk about the domination phase for estate planning attorneys. Just a few quick housekeeping matters before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be available to replay online next week. And we'll also make the slides available, so there's no need to take notes unless you'd like to. We do have a lot of ground to cover today. This webinar is scheduled to run for two hours, but it may run a bit under or a bit over, just depending upon how quickly we get through today's material. We won't be able to answer questions during the presentation, but if you are having technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar audio or video, let us know via the chat area of the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll have a questions and answers session at the end of the presentation, so if you do have questions along the way, please add them to the questions area or send us a public or private chat message, and we will address those at the end of the webinar. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, my name is Victoria Blut, and I'm the community manager here at Lawlytics. And my job is to keep attorneys on the cutting edge of web technologies and online legal marketing and to help you learn what works on the web. I come from a journalism background, and if you happen to be a frequent reader of our blog or a regular attendee of our webinars, you may recognize me. If you joined us for the first two webinars in this series, you'll recall that I went into great detail about how search engines work, about the various types of content that lawyers should include when they're starting their websites, as well as exploring other ideas, like how social media can work with your law firm's website to amplify your firm's signal, extend your reach, and reinforce your reputation. And if you attended the first webinar in this series, you're likely already familiar with our other presenter as well. But if you're not, I just want to give you a quick introduction to her before we get started. Rachel Shalott holds a JD and a master's and practiced law before joining Lawlytics. She is the vice president of content operations, and she's in charge of all of our content operations, which produces millions of written words for our members' websites and blogs each year. And in the first two webinars in this series, Rachel demonstrated the basic building blocks of content to get law firms started in the right direction. And then she built on that information in the Grow series to take you deeper into the strategy and the execution of growing an estate planning web presence. Before Rachel and I present, I also want to briefly introduce you to our CEO, Attorney Dan Jaffe, and I want to spend a little bit of time on some foundational items as well. So before Dan became the full-time CEO of Lawlytics, he built two successful law firms in both Washington State and Arizona, and he started a highly successful online legal directory that was later acquired by a large internet company. And during Dan's years of practice, he himself will tell you that he made a lot of marketing investments and he also got badly burned several times. And what this led him to realize was that nobody was going to care about his practice like he did and that in order for him to succeed, he needed to understand how the internet functions, how potential clients are using the internet, and he needed to be in control of his marketing. So he did the heavy lifting to figure this out early on, and that's why he co-founded Lawlytics to make it easy for attorneys to be in control of their marketing without wasting their time or money and today he loves showing his fellow attorneys how this stuff really works. So what is Lawlytics? I want to briefly review who we are, what we do, and why it matters. So you have many choices of companies and technologies to design, build, host, and help you market your law firm's website. And at Lawlytics, we do all of that, and we also have a lot of competition. So what is Lawlytics? How are we different? Our company is really obsessed with the pursuit of the most efficient method of marketing for each law firm. And there are two major variables of efficiency. There's time and there's money. And Lawlytics was created to empower law firms to have unlimited marketing success without wasting time or money. 
and we have two different types of competitors. So on the one side are full service marketing companies like Fine Law and Martindale Nolo. And Lawlytics is built to give attorneys all of the upsides of using a full service company without exposing you to the potential risks and downsides. And on the other side of it are DIY website software programs like WordPress and Wix that are cheap or free to use. But these programs tend to come with very steep opportunity costs and attorneys often struggle to make them work, which has them wasting their time and missing opportunities along the way. So while both full service companies and do it yourself platforms are viable options, Lawlytics offers a more practical solution for lawyers. Our company works exclusively with attorneys and our services are adaptable to every stage of a law firm's growth. So our members can start as small as they choose and then grow as big as they decide without taking dangerous risks or committing to things that might not work. And because our software is built exclusively for lawyers, the learning curve is really easy and that enables our members to add to and edit their websites and turn their efforts into new business without struggling. If you're joining us in this webinar after having seen the Start and the Grow series for estate planning attorneys, then you probably have a good sense of where we might be headed. But for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, I just want to give you the framework for where you are in this webinar to make sure that you're in the right place. This three-part series for estate planning attorneys lays out a clear roadmap for successful legal marketing because we recognize that the path to cost-effective and efficient law firm marketing online is often quite unclear for attorneys. Sometimes that's a problem of not knowing what to do or what works. Other times attorneys may understand what they need to do, but they're just not sure how to do it. Other times it's a matter of getting distracted by the latest trend or getting tripped up by SEO sales talk and other things that can keep you from your goals. But to do this right, we recommend implementing the information that's in this series in chronological order. So here's a quick review of what was discussed in the first two parts of this series. In the start series, we explained how to get started with a law firm web presence, and that's whether you're brand new to online legal marketing or if you have a website already, but it's just not working for your firm. We laid the groundwork for marketing your estate planning firm with sound and sustainable strategies and how to use that foundation to take your marketing where you want it to go. So we explained the basics and we showed you that Really, to start smart, you need to be able to do just a couple things well. And so long as you avoid the traps and the tricks, that foundation will take you as far as you want to go. And then in the Grow series, we went over a variety of tools and tips that can assist you in your long-term content strategy, as well as how to understand the key performance indicators that help you market your firm effectively and without wasting time or money. We also discussed a lot of the vanity metrics that SEO salespeople and legal marketers sometimes use that can confuse attorneys and send them down the wrong path or keep them on the hook without having anything real to show for it. And now we're at the dominate phase, which is going to show you, as it says here, how to climb to the top and how to stay there without wasting your time or money and also without having to watch your back. So if you haven't seen the first two webinars in this series, that's okay. I certainly encourage you to stay and listen to what we have to say today. But I do also recommend that you go back and check out those first two webinars because as I'm about to explain, trying to implement these tactics out of order is unlikely to produce the kinds of results that you want. It's really about knowing what to do, how to do it, and in what order these things need to be done. So, a question that you may have thought about, or maybe you haven't yet, is this. When should I enter this phase? When am I ready to dominate my market? And the answer to that is based on several things. First, it's a matter of understanding the fundamentals and applying them. And that's why you'll hear me and Rachel keep stressing that if you haven't seen those first two webinars in this series, go back and watch them. And it's not just the knowledge is power aspect here. It's knowledge and action that matters. Knowing what's going to move the needle is one thing. 
actually applying those fundamentals to your law firm's web presence consistently over time is really another. So make sure that you have that solid content foundation for your law firm's website and blog and that you have a plan and a strategy as you're moving forward. The next thing that's worth considering when you're wondering whether you're going to be ready to enter this particular phase of your law firm's growth is looking at some data that's related to your law firm's web presence. How many visits is your site getting? And this really isn't a cut and dry number for every attorney or firm out there. Your geography is going to play a part in this as well. So for example, if you are part of a smaller market, you might be ready to start thinking about dominating your market if you're getting 200 visits a day. However, if you are in a much larger and a much more competitive market, something like Los Angeles or New York, then this number might shoot up to, you know, a thousand visits a day before you're ready to start thinking about this phase. So knowing your total addressable market is important as well. And if you were with us for the second part of this webinar series, you probably heard Dan and I discuss this concept when we were talking about growth risks in terms of attorneys who are sometimes focused on what is ultimately an unsupportable market. They're trying to squeeze more business out of it than the market supports. But the bottom line there was that it's essential to know what your total addressable market is and then optimize your marketing for that reality. So we have attorney members here at Lawlytics who are now in the dominate phase after following our advice from the start and the grow webinars who have avoided all of the traps and the tricks that so often get attorneys into trouble and their websites are now receiving tens of thousands of visits a month and in a lot of cases, cases thousands of visits in a day. So whether you are a Lawlytics member right now or you're thinking about becoming one and you want a roadmap for how to get there, reach out to us and we'll put together a comprehensive plan for your firm that can help you achieve those goals. At Lawlytics, there are a couple of things that we really firmly believe. And the first is that having a law firm website that you own and that you control, when you pair that with an investment in a solid content strategy, that can become an appreciating asset for you and your firm. And we also see it that there are two things that you can invest into your online marketing and in particular your law firm website and blog. One is money, the other one is time. And as it so often goes in life, there's a chance that you'll have more of one than the other, just depending upon where you are in the growth phase of your firm. So let's first consider the case of a young attorney who's just starting out. This person may not have a lot of money, they may not have a lot of clients yet, but what they might have is time. And therefore, writing their own content can really be a smart investment of the time that they have available to them. As we've said previously, the internet is the great equalizer and marketing has become a meritocracy. So you no longer have to have the biggest budget in the game in order to compete. So if this young attorney happens to have more time available than money, with a solid content plan and with a clear roadmap, they can use their time wisely to produce their own substantive content and blog posts that puts their firm on the board and helps them get noticed by potential clients. Now, as they move along and as their business starts to grow, they're going to have more clients, they'll be making more money. And at this point, they may still want to continue writing their content, but they might also choose to delegate a little bit of their content as well, even if they themselves continue adding to their website. Here's the problem. As you grow, particularly as you're taking on more and more clients, writing your own content has an opportunity cost. As you're growing and growing, you are suddenly going to have some serious demands placed on your time. And it's why we mentioned in the last webinar that it's worth thinking about things like intake systems and so on and so forth before you get to this point, because you don't want to let yourself get overwhelmed. But one of the things that you're going to have to think about as these demands are placed on your time is the opportunity cost of writing your own content. It's the choice that has to be made between what is often mutually exclusive, money or time. And to illustrate this point, let's look at how our content creation department here at Lawlytics actually evolved. So when Lawlytics first started, our early adopters were very excited about writing content. 
For the first time, they had access to a system that would not only allow them to easily publish optimized content to their own websites and blogs, but they had our system to make sure that they were doing it well. And attorneys who use Lawlytics to write their own content and follow our recipe over time are successful and achieve market leading results. And as a byproduct of the success, they become busier in their practices. And what this presents is a catch 22 for attorneys who also want to sleep and have a work life balance. They know that the content they're writing using Lawlytics is fueling their success, but their success is preventing them from continuing to write or demanding other sacrifices. In order to keep up the reward cycle of writing content, many of our early adopters realized that in order to sustain the edge that they got through content writing using Lawlytics, they were going to have to delegate that task to somebody else. And our content creation department evolved out of that need. So the more clients you've got, the less time you have to keep writing content. And you can't just stop writing content. Having new content added to your site is an important factor that Google takes into consideration for um, rankings and relevancy. And the freshness of your content is something that Rachel is going to discuss um, in a little more depth shortly. But to keep the flywheel moving, you have to have new content. And if new demands are being placed on your time and you can't write it because you want to be focused on the practice of law, your rankings could suffer, which would then likely harm your revenue, and the whole thing can fall apart. So it's a complicated dance because, of course, you want to keep up that momentum that you've worked so hard for. This is where that other investment comes into play, money. So if you're in the dominate phase, you have a marketing budget to work with that is likely larger than what a beginning attorney would have. So you may not have the time to write anymore, but you do have the money. And here's where it may be time to delegate your content creation efforts to somebody else. Now, before I get into how to do this wisely, there's a couple points I want to make, particularly on the ethics of ghostwriting, because there is a camp of purists on the web who argue that attorneys should always, and under all circumstances, write their own content for their law firm websites and blogs. And in an ideal world, we agree with that. But in the real world, where balancing a practice with the business side of law while trying to maintain a quality of life, you can see where I'm going with this. So those who argue against proxy writing of online content will point out that if the attorney does not write their own website content, that it lacks authenticity or that the content misleads readers into believing that, um, you know, that the content came directly from the attorney. Some will argue that it's unethical. Some assert that all lawyers are natural writers or love writing or should not only provide the content for their websites, but should also enjoy doing so. And each of these arguments contains logical and practical fallacies. And we've gone into greater detail about the ethics of ghostwriting in a webinar that's available on demand over at the Lawlytics website, and that specifically addresses this topic. But overall, my point is this. If you are comfortable delegating the creation of a brief, proofreading it, and then signing your name onto it and submitting it to the court, then the analogy is exactly the same when a ghostwriter is writing content for you. So now on to delegating successfully. In order to use a ghostwriter successfully, it comes down to a couple things. The first is delegating wisely. The second is empowering people that not only understand, but will abide by the necessary ethics, and also being able to keep a level of editorial control that makes you feel comfortable saying that as the attorney who's responsible for the content on your website, you know what's been published. So by choosing a professional writer that you can hold accountable, you can maintain a consistent publishing schedule that ensures that your website and blog aren't going to be neglected because we have seen plenty of law firm websites that have these large bursts of content creation, especially on the blog. You know, it might be 10 posts in a month and then the blog just goes dormant for months or years. And the problem is that 
content marketing isn't optimally effective when you simply put some content on your blog and then quit. It works best with the consistent publication of posts that answer your clients' questions in detail. So it's easy to get enthusiastic about blogging for short periods of time. It's harder to sustain that enthusiasm over the long term. And persistence with blogging and other forms of content creation on your law firm's website, like substantive pages, um, persistence with that on a regular basis is what is going to get you ahead. So if you pause your blogging efforts, your competition who isn't pausing, and that could be a well-funded firm who's delegating their content to writers or, um, you know, like the example we saw earlier with an attorney who's fresh out of law school and they have all the time in the world to blog, they'll get ahead of you if you're not adding content to your law firm's website and blog regularly. Just a couple last things um, before I hand this over to Rachel. I do want to briefly point out something. So. If you are a Lawlytics member or you've been with us for a few webinars, then you know how easy it is to use Lawlytics to add to and edit your website. And what we also make it easy to do is allow you to delegate those tasks to others, such as in the case where you have a partner or an associate who's going to blog. But on top of that, we also make it easy for you to have control in the cases where you do hire a professional proxy writer. The Lawlytics user access controls that are featured in our control panel really make delegating this work to others a total breeze. And that's without relinquishing the kind of control that you as the attorney need over your web presence. So as you can see here, you can add a um, an unlimited number of users, and then for each user, indicate who that person is ghostwriting for. As you can see in this example here, we've got a summer associate who's going to ghostwrite for Dan. And as you can see here as well, there's that little blue checkbox that says requires approval before publishing. And what that makes sure of is that you have control over what goes on your website, even if you have somebody else ghostwriting for you. There are additional permissions that you can select as well. And that ensures that the person who's ghostwriting has as little or as much access to things like your sites, if you have multiple websites, your blog posts, your case results, your social media, and so on. If you're curious to learn more about the effective use of ghostwriters, I really recommend checking out a webinar that we did on that subject um, a little while ago. And the web address to access it is at the bottom of your screen there. So. One last point that I want to make to you is this. Your time is valuable, and especially so if you're in the domination phase of your law firm's growth. The quality content that you add to your law firm's website on a regular basis is really the key to starting and growing a successful web presence and ultimately dominating your market. But if you can't write it for your website on a regular basis, then using a professional proxy writer is the next best choice that you can make. And as I said earlier, the Lawlytics content department evolved out of that very specific need. So attorneys who had been writing their own content and as a result of it got so successful that they needed help to keep publishing. And today we're writing millions of words of content for attorney websites and blogs. Rachel Shalott, who's going to speak to you in just a moment, is the Vice President of Content Operations, and she oversees this entire effort. But, but before I turn it over to her, um, I do want to talk briefly about our content creation services for those who are interested. We have an in-house content creation department that is managed by lawyers. Many of our writers are lawyers. All of them have strong writing and legal backgrounds. And all of the content that gets published on behalf of our customers who choose us to write for them goes through an editorial process where lawyers look at it before it ever gets published. We have several levels of content creation that we provide. These are services ranging from startup content when, um, you know, say there's a brand new site that doesn't have any content to get it off the ground, to creating attorney bios, creating practice areas, and so forth, all the way up to these really extensive build outs of over a million words for attorneys who want to, over the course of a year or more, build a dominating website for a certain practice area or practices or for certain geographic areas. But between those extremes, we also have a la carte content. So say you're writing your own content and something comes up and you don't want to have a lag in your content. We can jump in, 
pick up where you left off and sustain it until you can jump back in and start working again. And we also have the ability to do ongoing recurring monthly blogging and content creation for our clients. The last thing I want to say here is that at Lawlytics, we really pride ourselves on having more than just a vendor-customer relationship with you. We take a lot of time at the outset to get to know you and to create a partnership that allows you to participate as little or as much as you want in the content creation for your law firm website. We want to know how you like your content written as far as voice goes. We want to get to know your objectives, to get to know your practice area. We look at what you're trying to accomplish and what you've already accomplished, and then we make a plan to get there. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about building on your content. Rachel? Thank you, Victoria. As you heard earlier, prior to joining Lawlytics, I practiced criminal defense in Pennsylvania, and now I oversee the Lawlytics content department. We work with our attorney clients to plan, create, and refine their web content. When we work with firms who really have a dominating site, we generally see content structured in the following ways. First off, there will be a substantial base of evergreen or substantive pages. And these include practice area pages, reputational pages, and local pages. If you were with us during our grow session, I discussed achieving a target site size for your market area. Over the past few years, we've been conducting market research to see what makes attorney sites that are utilizing organic content marketing successful in a variety of metro areas across the United States in a variety of different practice areas. And the one constant we've always observed is that the dominating sites have the highest page volume in that market area. The best thing about organic content marketing is that this base will be your single most valuable asset and you're going to get an incredibly high ROI. The bulk of the time and resources will go into the initial content build. And that's not to say that it won't be quite a substantial undertaking because it will be. When we've executed really, really dominant builds, these typically span from around 18 months and have ranged up to two to three years. But the reason why this is an investment that is absolutely worth it is because the value from your content build will only grow and grow throughout subsequent years. After you've achieved a substantial size, you can shift from a creation or addition phase to what we think of as enhancement or maintenance phase. And what I mean by enhancing your website is that you're going to start to add collateral to the site that will increase the appeal of the site to potential clients and other visitors. And we're going to discuss potential enhancements to your site, including infographics and white papers, in just a few moments. Next, these firms employ a blogging strategy to keep their site fresh and up to date. And finally, they utilize a sophisticated sharing strategy to get their content to the widest possible audience and to establish solid personal connections with that audience. Right now, I'd like to focus a little bit more in depth on blogging. Blogging can serve a variety of purposes. Blog content can be shared via social media, increasing the range of your potential audience. The blog content also has the potential to be interactive. That is, potential clients, others in the field can read a blog post and comment, opening up new channels of communication with your firm. However, we sometimes see firms who neglect blogging because they think that if the blog content does not have a certain level of activity on social media, or if a post doesn't receive a certain amount of comments, it really isn't doing anything for them. Now this line of thinking is problematic because it neglects another important role that blog content can play. And that's, this is especially true for a really dominating site, and that is to keep the site fresh. Reaching a desired build of evergreen pages is very important to establishing your site as an authority in a particular area. However, 
when you're in the grow phase and you're adding these pages, that's doing something very important for your site as far as search engines go. Now, the size of your site will be instrumental in getting strong search engine rankings. But as we see here in this excerpt from Google's Search Engine Optimization Starter Guide, it is important that your content is not only unique, but also that it is fresh. Like I mentioned, when you're in a growth phase where you're making these additions, you're adding these substantive pages, the content will be fresh because you're going to be making regular additions. However, once you have that build pretty much complete, you don't need to make regular drastic changes to your site, and obviously changes in the law don't happen that often to even allow for this. But what we have seen when a site is dominating a major market area is that if nothing is added to the site for a particular period of time, it can start to slip in the rankings and search engines will begin to favor newer sites, even those that tend to be a little bit smaller. And this is where blogging really comes in. Blogging will help keep your site appearing fresh to search engines and will help maintain your strong ranking. We found that adding a few blog posts per week can really help to prevent any type of decline in rankings. Additionally, blogging can serve as a base for forming deeper connections with your target audience, be it current, former, and or potential clients. Your blog content can be a rich source of shareable material that you can use not only across your social media platforms, but many firms who are in this phase take social media a step forward with direct email newsletters. These are sent to a list which can be generated from current and former clients and or those who took a subscription action on your site. Newsletters allow your firm to showcase content that you think would be particularly relevant or interesting and it helps cement this deeper personal connection that you'll have with your audience. And now I'd like to transition to discussing substantive pages when you're really in this dominant position. And there are two things I'd like to address. The first is enhancing your site volume. When you've reached this phase, your site contains a multitude of pages that directly relate to your practice area and the, service, the services your firm offers. In our earlier webinar series, you may have heard me caution attorneys against using any of their valuable time or resources to cover topics that don't directly relate to what your firm does. But once we've reached, or we're striving to reach, this really dominant position, I do change my tune on this. Now is the time to start adding these pages. Pages that are basically educational in nature and that they do not directly relate to a service that you will be providing for a client. If you're just starting out or you're growing your site, you don't want to waste resources covering topics from which you're not going to obtain clients or revenue, so we wouldn't include these in an initial content plan. However, once we've comprehensively covered the types of cases you do take, you have the ability, and you absolutely should, start to branch out and cover related topics. Again, what we're doing here is we're adding to the overall authority of your site for a particular area. We want that site to dominate any queries related to this area in a metro area or maybe even in a full state. The breadth of ancillary topics that you should cover should be consistent with target site size. And that is, it's going to depend on your geographic location, what your competitors are doing. So, of course, we would not give the same advice to someone who's in a top five major metro and someone who's in a small rural area. This is always going to dictate the amount necessary and there is no one size fits all advice for your target volume. I'd also like to talk about updating your substantive pages. The reason why we label these pages evergreen is that the content on them is unlikely to change. However, when a state or federal law is updated or a new piece of case law comes out, this can necessitate an update of your site. For example, let's say there's a change to the federal estate tax rate. When you have a really large site, it can be incredibly difficult to locate every instance where you've referenced this particular statute. One of the things we do recommend is that firms create some type of resource. A spreadsheet is a really easy way to do this, where you keep an index of where, in terms of which pages, you have particular statutory information. 
That way, if there is an announced change, you can easily locate the pages you will need to update. And now I want to speak about those site enhancements that I mentioned earlier. There are different types of collateral that you can add to your site, which will really enhance the experience of a user visiting the site. There are many types, including ebooks, but I'm going to take some time and talk about two particular types white papers and infographics. White papers generally range in the three to seven page length and their documents that cover a particular topic in great detail. For example, you might create a white paper that gives a really comprehensive overview of how a trust is created and administered. These documents serve a variety of purposes. They can be an educational resource for a visitor to your site who really wants a nuanced understanding of a particular topic. We've also worked with many firms who use white papers in a more traditional sense as a print resource. Some firms will mail relevant packets to clients who come in for an initial consultation. Others take white papers and leave them for distribution in an area where they might have potential clients. As far as density of information goes, infographics are kind of on the other side of the spectrum from white papers. They illustrate concepts in graphical form, and the focus in with these is much more on the visual depiction than on the text. For example, you might create an infographic comparing a will and a trust. And infographics can greatly enhance the experience a visitor has on your site. They capitalize upon the strong preference many users have for visual information, and also the shortening of the attention span we've seen over the past few years as information is being more consumed more and more on mobile devices. Additionally, infographics are highly shareable, and they tend to be quite popular on social media. There are a variety of tools available to create free infographics, but I do want to mention a word of caution here. The most effective infographics and white papers will following the brand guidelines of your firm. You want your colors and your logo to remain consistent across platforms. And you also want to make sure they're paired with colors, which are not only complementary in terms of palette, but that are also utilized appropriately to evoke a desired response from an intended audience. If you were with us during the Grow series of these webinars, you heard Sophia, one of our senior graphic designers, discuss the psychological elements of colors. Different colors have been found to evoke different emotional responses, and this is something that should absolutely be taken into account when creating these types of collateral for your site. It is very difficult to use a template system and maintain consistency with your brand guidelines, as well as ensure the use of proper complementary colors, so it's something we generally advise against. For those on the Lawlytics platform, the same team of graphic and web designers who imported and configured or who created your logo will be responsible for creation of things such as white papers and infographics so we can ensure that all visual elements are consistent and that they are embedded seamlessly into your website and appropriately configured for both desktop and mobile users. When you're just starting out, when you're starting to grow your site, the focus will be on content creation and our goal is getting more visitors to the site. But when you've reached a really dominating position, you are getting those high visitor numbers. But what you're in a position to deal with is other sites who are also getting these high numbers. So what we want to do now is give users the most memorable, the most positive, and the most unique experience. And Collateral is a great way to do this. So when you've reached the phase where you're really dominating a market area, chances are you will be experiencing changes along the way. These might be minor, such as adding some associates, or they might be major such as bringing on a new partner, changing the name of your firm, or planning a major expansion. When you're faced with a major change, it's really important to have a strategy in mind and not to neglect your web presence. You want to create a plan of action as early as you possibly can, just as you might for other necessary steps in a change, such as leasing office space. If your firm will be experiencing a change in name, will you keep your logo the same? Oftentimes, logo change can be necessary because partner initials can be a substantial part of 
a law firm logo. If you're changing your logo, will you change other elements in your branding guidelines? Will your colors change, or are they going to stay the same? If you're faced with a different type of change, such as maybe moving locations or opening new offices, what should you do on your site in order to accommodate this? Does this warrant additional web content? Do you need to review your existing calls to action on the bottom of each page to make sure that new geographic information is proper, properly communicated to potential clients? And if you're faced with a very sudden change, such as a partner or associate leaving to start a rival firm, how are you going to handle this as far as your website is concerned? One of the chief reasons that we designed Lawlytics to give the attorney such a high degree of control is to empower you to be able to quickly make changes to things such as your attorney staff, should you be faced with a major change. You can also easily unpublish one page or page groups if you need to make unanticipated changes and there's information that you don't want to appear live on your site in the interim. So it's always a good idea to keep these things on your radar and to sketch out a tentative plan of action for how you would handle potential changes should they arise in the future. So the last thing I want to touch on is a change and a really positive one that we commonly see with firms who are in this phase and that's expansion. Firms who come to dominate a particular area have the ability to expand into new areas. Sometimes this can be a new metro area, sometimes an additional state, a tri-state region. We've even assisted with nationwide expansions. When you're preparing for an expansion, there are major concerns you should address related to your web presence. Again, like I mentioned, when we're discussing change, you should develop a plan of action, review things such as your call to action at the bottom of each page, um, and a common concern when you're facing an expansion to a particularly new geographic area is how to add content. We've had firms who integrate new geographic areas into existing sites very successfully, but we've also seen the launch of multiple sites be very successful as well. And there are a variety of concerns to weigh when deciding how to proceed. There might be ethical implications. For example, some states require particular disclaimer language to be located on each web page. Other states require that content be submitted to the state's bar prior to publication. In these circumstances, if having separate sites can help you make sure that you're within compliance with the state bar, this might be the best route to take. However, some firms choose to create separate sections for new geographic regions within their existing site. Doing so can add to the overall authority of the site and allow the new sections to benefit from the strong existing presence of the site. In addition, taking on a new practice area can also present really similar issues. Incorporating a new practice area on your site can have the benefit of your established presence. But if you're seeking to highlight one element in particular, it might be that having a multiple site could be a better way to address this because it allows you to focus really narrowly on a few things, a few elements that you might want to highlight about your firm. And finally, many dominant firms engage in what I'll call informational expansion. And this is when firms do not expand into new jurisdictions, but the information on their website does expand to these new areas. For example, you might have a section on your site that compares requirements for a valid will in all 50 states. So even if you don't plan on expanding to these other states, what you're doing is you're opening up avenues to make the site visit experience much more rich for the user in terms of integrating elements such as a clickable map, or infographics, and you're also establishing your firm as the ultimate authority on a particular subject. So just to wrap up, if you have more specific questions regarding content for your site, I really encourage you to shoot us an email at writing at lawlytics.com. 
Some of you might already be familiar with her, but Alyssa Rhodes is the director of our content services. And over the past couple of years, she's helped many attorneys plan and create content. So if you have a brief question, you want some additional resources, or assistance planning for the long term, we're more than happy to help. And I'm now going to turn the mic back over to Victoria, who's going to cover a few more critical elements before we wrap up for the day. Thanks, Rachel. So a few last things that I want to mention before we complete this webinar. And one of them is the risks that you face at this stage of your growth. Some of these are going to be familiar to you if you've been with us for the first two parts of this webinar series. And some of the risks that you'll face at this stage may be new. The first is bad practices. And this one is a risk that is a risk to you at any point throughout your law firm's growth. But in this stage, it can be particularly dangerous because of all the work that you've already put in and all of the progress that you've made. And bad practices here can include things that you do yourself or things that you may not know are being done on your behalf. Bad links are one of those things that can cause trouble and other things like duplicate pages or duplicate content. But if you need a refresher on all of the bad practices that can get you into trouble with Google, I definitely recommend that you go check out Google's webmaster guidelines to make sure that you stay on the right side of things. And that said, if you have somebody else handling some aspect of your web presence, that you know what's being done and why and whether that's in line with what Google expects. Next one is algorithm changes. And this one is related to the first one to some degree because if you've been engaging in bad practices, particularly ones that go against Google's webmaster guidelines, you could be in trouble the next time that Google makes an algorithm change. And recently it's been a matter of they used to announce these algorithm changes, now they don't. So um, there's very little time to prepare if you're engaging in some sort of bad practice. And keep in mind that at scale, bad practices are amplified. So the more visible you are, plus whatever bad practices you're engaging in, that can mean the more likely that it is for someone to report your practices to the authorities. And the more likely it is that all of the work that you've done up to this point can come tumbling down. So um, on that note, when you have a solid content strategy and one that, that focuses on providing value and useful information to your potential clients when you understand the rules of Google. You're not going to have to sweat the next time Google makes an algorithm change because you'll know that what you're doing is on the right track and well within their guidelines. The target on your back. So I recognize that that sounds kind of ominous, but the higher that you climb and the more success that you have, the more that you may find others trying to copy what you're doing. And sometimes that includes downright copying your content. The content that you create may not only attract potential clients, it may also attract your competitors. And that can be really frustrating after all of the work that you've put in to create work that's original and useful for your potential clients to have somebody come along and just copy it for their own website. Now, if you find that someone is stealing your content, there are some things that you can do. There are definitely tools that you can use for detection in the first place to see if someone is copying your content. Um, Google Alerts is a good one. Copyscape is another good one. But if you do find your work somewhere else on the web, there are some tactics that you can employ. And the first thing that you may want to try and do is pick up the phone and call the attorney who's copying your content. And we've talked about this a lot in this webinar series um, about things that are done for attorneys by legal marketers and webmasters and copywriters that the attorneys who hire them may not even know about. And this could be a case like that. It's possible that this attorney hired someone and that person lifted your content for this attorney's site. So sometimes calling the attorney directly can resolve this issue. And it doesn't hurt either to follow up your phone call with an email, which of course will provide you with a record of your request and what was said. But if that doesn't work, either you cannot reach the person by telephone, they are not answering their emails, or they do respond to you and they're simply refusing to remove that content. There's always the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or the DMCA. And a DMCA takedown is when content is removed from a website at the request of the owner of the content or the owner of the copyright of the content. 
But at the end of the day, keep in mind that your time is valuable and you only have so much of it. And if you spend too much time running around after people who are copying your work, that'll take away from your ability to produce even more content for your site. And perhaps more importantly, it'll keep you from being focused on your practice. So really, it's a balance. Sabotage. So sabotage can show up in a variety of different forms. Of the many reasons we caution against using pay-per-click or PPC to carry your law firm's marketing, there is click fraud to think about. So if a competitor knows that you're using PPC, they might just click on your ads because they can, which of course costs you money without anything to show for it. And as we've said in previous webinars, PPC comes with some risks in that the people who are clicking on your ads they might be accidental clicks, they might be potential clients, but they also might be your competitors. And whether or not that person is an actual potential client who may actually convert, once that money is gone, it's gone. Another form of sabotage that could come up, though it would really take an extraordinary amount of time and effort on the part of whoever was responsible, would be submitting your site to link farms and directories that have been sources of spam. I will say this, once you are really well established as you would be in the domination phase of growth and you have these huge content build outs with millions of words and tons of useful information for your potential clients and you're generating a lot of revenue from that work, if someone were to do that, it would be established pretty quickly that you were likely not responsible for such a thing. It just would not make sense that you would do something like that after all the work that you've put in and all of the success that you've had. However, a more likely method of sabotage would be a competitor who hires someone or a company to try and smear your reputation. And this is why we really stress, as we did in the last webinar, to get on top of your reputation management early. Ask for those reviews often. Start building up those resources early on. And here at Lawlytics, we do offer a bird eye reputation management add-on for our attorney members. And we also offer it to our non-members. It's just not as deeply discounted as it is with our membership. So if you're curious about that, we rec recently did a webinar on the subject of reputation management that also covers the bird eye add-on. And that's now available to view on demand over at our website. Lastly, I want to bring up what could be described as the 1% difference makers, but before I discuss what they are, I want to mention why it's important to implement these difference makers now and not at some earlier point in your foundation and growth strategies, because this is one of those things that can trip up attorneys. This is an area where attorneys want to obsess over implementing these little bits right out of the gate, but if you do that, they're not going to have the effect that they will if you do them once the foundation has been established. So let's talk about what they are. The first one is semantic markup. If you're not familiar with this term, semantic markup refers to the code that's used to reinforce the meaning of your web pages to search engines, which can help them be found when potential clients make relevant searches. Humans, of course, have eyes. We can look at something and make a determination about what a web page means or what it's about. Search engines can't do that. And this markup helps the search engine understand what a page is about and whether it's relevant to somebody's interests when they make a relevant search. With Lawlytics, our system automatically adds attorney-specific markup that is strategic and effective and helps your work get found by potential clients. And it also doesn't require you to quit your day job to learn how to code or anything like that. Page speed. So page speed is one of these issues that attorneys, again, sometimes obsess about. And we brought it up in the Grow webinar for this estate planning series. But I'm going to bring it up again because I do think it's valuable to understand what role this plays in your law firm's web presence. I'm going to reiterate just briefly what was discussed in the last webinar, and that's this. If you were to take a completely blank website, white page, that site is likely to score a perfect score on a site speed calculator. Unfortunately, it's also useless, but 
as you keep adding elements to a site, you're going to see a decrease in the site speed. Now, if you add a lot of heavy elements, um, a lot of unnecessary bells and whistles, then you're really going to see that number drop. So what we explained in that webinar, if you didn't join us for it, it's about striking the balance between a completely empty website, which of course wouldn't do you any good, and a site that's overloaded with elements that are slowing it down. Now, once you are at the domination phase of your growth, there's something else to consider here. Where site speed is concerned, so long as your site is reasonably fast, so we're talking 70th percentile, 80 in mobile, it doesn't make too much of a difference. However, if you are getting 15,000 visits a day, you're going to get some from mobile on a 3G connection, and that could mean a slow loading site. And as we know, if a site loads too slowly, a potential client's first line of defense is just to leave and go find another site that answers their question. So getting big numbers means that there's something else um, additional that you have to balance, not just the elements of the site anymore, but the number of visitors that you're receiving. Marketing automation. When you have few visitors at first, your goal should be to get visitors to your site. But as your site grows as in your, and as your visits grow, you'll want to build up your options. It's not going to be enough anymore to have your options be contact my firm or leave. And really, that's not even enough in the early phases. You want to give your potential clients lots of text information about their case or matter or problem. But when you start hitting those big numbers, then it's time to think about a variety of ways to present that information. So like what Rachel was talking about, ebooks, white papers, um, other collateral, newsletter subscriptions. And while you have to either create those yourself or hire someone to do it for you, sending these items to potential clients are things that can be handled efficiently by marketing automation software. And I've written a number of blogs um, on a number of popular marketing automation software tools for attorneys that you can find over at the Lawlytics blog. But that way, once you've done that work or you've hired someone to do the work of creating that collateral, then you can use marketing automation software to send it for you and create that connection between you and your potential client. And that includes even outside of office hours and you're already home. Um, marketing automation can help you do more work and reach more clients around the clock. Things to experiment with. CTAs. When you are at the biggest phase of your growth, this is a good time to start experimenting with the calls to action that you feature on your website. So try different action words, try different phrasing, see what draws in more clients. Form fields. Form fields are another good thing to experiment with. Your potential clients are busy just as you are. They don't want to have to do any more work than what is necessary to reach you. So where you can, see if you can edit down your form fields to whatever is absolutely necessary. And there was a good example of this recently in the news with Expedia, in fact. So on the one hand, this is a story about how to root out hidden profits with analytics, but Expedia discovered a very interesting problem. They were noticing that they had many customers who were clicking their buy now button, but then they never went on to complete their transaction. So what was happening? Here we have people who, as far as leading indicators of purchase intent go, they said they appeared to be ready to finish that transaction, but they didn't. So when they conducted their research, what they found was something oddly simple. Expedia had this optional field under the, um, the field for name, which was company. And as it turns out, what happened was that that company field confused customers who filled that field out with their bank name. So after they'd put in their bank name, these customers then went on to enter the address of their bank rather than their home address. So when it came time to verify their credit card, it would fail because it wasn't the address of the card holder. When Expedia fixed this problem, they actually increased their profits by $12 million. This, of course, is an extreme example, but my point here is to minimize any sort of user error or frustration that might happen with your form fields. Don't make your potential clients work any harder than they have to. And Expedia later said that they'd found a number of other issues like this by not only using their data to their advantage, but also by really paying attention to their customers. 
Think about setting expectations on your form. If you say that you can return calls within five minutes and, you know, as a solo practitioner that's just starting out, that works for you. But as things grow, that's just not true anymore. It's the difference between not being able to meet that expectation anymore and changing that expectation on your form or having a better intake system with two or three people who are available to answer the phone. Last thing is call tracking. At Lawlytics, we can help you integrate things like CallRail, which can help you measure your calls and see where they're coming from so you can see what's driving them and then use that information to fine tune your marketing even more. So this is the last webinar in our Start, Grow, Dominate series for estate planning attorneys. And again, if you missed those first two webinars, feel free to go check them out over on the Lawlytics website or for that matter, any of our other free on-demand webinars and blog posts. All of those resources are available to you for free to help you better understand how the internet works and how your potential clients are using it to find you. If you have questions about your legal marketing or you're feeling ready to take your online marketing to the next level, we are here to help you and we're happy to talk with you. So feel free to contact us through any of the above methods. You can submit a consultation request from our main website at www.lawlytics.com. You can always call us at 800-713-0161 or you can shoot us an email at info at lawlytics.com. With that, I want to thank Rachel for her presentation today and I'm going to end the recording and go to questions.